Today, brothers and sisters, we are going to look at expectations. We're going to look at our personal expectations. We are going to consider the things that we trust as Christians. And we are also going to look at the things that we hope for in this world. But before we begin, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. We ask that you open our eyes and our ears, our hearts and our minds, so that we may hear your word. May your word come into us and change our hearts and minds according to your will. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, we're going to look at our expectations. We're going to examine how things are to be, or better yet, how we expect things to be. How we expect things to turn out, especially as Christians, from a Christian perspective. Many Christians come from backgrounds and environments, uh, influences, from a Christian message of hope, a Christian message of prosperity, a so-called Christian message of everything is going to be all right. And this message of hope, prosperity, a message that everything is going to be all right, like David said in the Psalms, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. So, as Christians, many of us have certain expectations. When we consider ourselves Christian, born again, spirit led, we may attend church regularly and go to Bible studies on a regular basis. We participate in these endeavors or we rarely ever go to church or hardly ever or never attend a Bible study. But in any case, we still consider ourselves Christians. Some of us support the ministry effort with money and our time and others support with mostly feelings and lip service. And all of us, no matter what our behaviors may be, consider ourselves Christians. And as such, we have a certain level of expectations. We have an expectation of good things. We have a positive outlook. Everything is going to be all right because we are Christian. So today we're going to look at our expectations for the short term and the long term. And we are going to see how our personal expectations fit in with what is presented in the scriptures and our faith in God. Now, I want us to go to John chapter 20. And we are going to start in verse 24. And what we are going to look at is the actions and behaviors of Thomas. Thomas was one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus Christ. He was a member of the inner circle. At this time, he is considered an apostle. In John chapter 20, the text takes us to after the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus is now coming back on the scene, having been raised from the dead. But for some reason or another, Thomas is not around with his fellow disciples. And for all respects, we would consider Thomas to be a Christian. He had been walking and working with Christ for over three years now. He was an important member of Christ's inner circle of ministers to the public. He had been given the power to heal the sick, cast out demons, and evangelize the, world of God, the word of God to the public. He had been training now intimately with Christ for over three years. If Thomas is an example for us today, 
we would say based on the history on, on his history that he was a Bible believing Christian he would certainly have been counted among the faithful as far as we could see with with our physical eyes and human judgments Thomas had been walking and talking the talk. But after this incident with the crucifixion, death, and burial of Jesus Christ, Thomas had separated himself somewhat from his fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. Now when we pick up in verse 24 of John chapter 20, we will see what Thomas's situation is. Verse 24. Now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands, reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. Then Jesus told him, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, one verse I want to highlight is verse 27, and I will read from the King's James Version. It says, Then saith he to Thomas, Reach hither thy finger, and behold my hands, and reach hither thy hand, and thrust it into my side, and be not faithless, but believing. I tend to have an affinity for how the translators for the King James translated this verse. Be not faithless, but believing. These words of Christ to his disciple Thomas, be not faithless, but believing. This statement is something that a father may tell his son. Be a man, man up. Don't be a little boy. Be a man, son. Or a friend may tell another friend. Be a woman. Don't act like a little girl. Be a woman. Then there is the, that slogan from the military. Be all that you can be. That verb to be, as it is used here, is empowering and it gives guidance and direction to an individual. Jesus told his disciples, Thomas, to be, to be not faithless, but be believing. Because hitherto till now, Thomas was doubting. This is how he is commonly known as doubting Thomas. And in that first translation that I read, it says, stop doubting and believe. This statement is no less powerful than the statement, be not faithless, but believing. Both of these translations are equally correct in capturing the sentiment that is being portrayed in the original language. And when we look at these two translations of the original language, we get doubting being synonymous with faithless. Thomas doubting, or doubting Thomas as he is called, was in fact 
doubting the report and message that he was receiving from his brothers, that Jesus was in fact risen. For whatever reason at this time, Thomas was in a state of doubt. In other words, Thomas was faithless. Thomas was without faith. Now, what would cause Thomas to be in this position or state of doubt or faithlessness? What had affected his belief and his faith? Because like I said earlier, Thomas was a disciple, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He was a member of Christ's inner circle. He was an active member of the ministry effort. He had been empowered to heal the sick, cast out demons, and spread the message that the kingdom of God is upon us. Thomas was not a fair-weather Christian. He had walked and talked and lived with Jesus Christ for over three years. If anyone would be expected to have faith, it would be one of Jesus' 12 disciples, members of the inner circle. The disciples got the teachings and insight on the parables. The disciples, those who were close to Jesus, got special and in-depth teachings on the kingdom of God. We know this because the special teachings are recorded for us in the scriptures. But upon the assault of Christ's ministry, Christ's imprisonment and subsequent trial and execution, along with his death and burial, through all of these events, the separation of the disciples, the leader of the ministry has been captured and killed. Through all of these events, Thomas had lost his way. Not only had he lost his way, but he had lost his faith. He is now begin to doubt. Because although Christ had been informing and teaching his disciples that he would be taken captive and killed, although Christ had told his disciples numerous times of the events that would surely come about and soon, many of the disciples, including Thomas, did not necessarily comprehend the magnitude and gravity of what was to happen to Jesus Christ, their leader, their minister, and their Messiah. Even Peter, when Jesus informed them of his going away, his death, the cross, Peter had the gall to pull Jesus aside and say, now Jesus, these things are not going to happen. And we can be sure that Peter's sentiment and expectations for Christ were shared by many of the other disciples. No one had expected Christ to go out the way that he had. Not one of the disciples had the expectation that Christ would be captured, tried, embarrassed in front of the whole city, hung on the cross, killed and buried. Things were going to be good. The crowds were getting bigger. The people were clamoring for more and more of Christ. The ministry was the truth and setting people free from their physical bondages and infirmities. Surely this roller coaster ride of success would never end. Surely Christ was the Messiah that the scriptures had spoken about. This was surely the prophecy of God being fulfilled. After a few thousand years from the beginning of time, the kingdom of God is now upon us. Surely Thomas did not have the expectation of the tragedy of the cross. For God's sake, he had raised Lazarus from the dead along with others. Surely this accident, this tragedy, this death, the non-believing government officials taking charge and mistreating the Son of God, surely this is not the case. This cannot be. This was Thomas' reality, his hopes and his dreams, his expectations as a member in the ministry effort of Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, all of his expectations, his worldview, all of that came crashing down. 
his hope for his people, the Jewish nation, the nation of Israel, his hope for the world even, his expectation that all things would be set right now that the Messiah is on the scene. Isn't that what scripture tells us? Isn't that what it means to be a Christian? No more gloomy and bad days, no more accidents and tragedies. Now that Christ is on the scene, now that Christ is in my life, all things are now new. The dark clouds of my life and society have passed. Now that Christ is on the scene, now that Christ is in my life. But brothers and sisters, that was not the case. Jesus had tried to teach them the whole truth. In fact, Christ did tell them and prepare them for what was to come. Every reasonable attempt was made to teach and inform his disciples of the circumstances of the cross. They were clearly told what would happen. The only thing that I can say is from my own experience and the experiences that I'm aware of from others is that when things are going good, very few people take the time to consider the what ifs. We often get caught up in the revelry and the momentum of a positive way, a positive economy, a healthy medical report, that good job with benefits, that family member who we think is always going to be there and we will eventually make time to go see them. And even as Christians, we are instructed by scriptures to meditate on those good things, the honorable things, those things which are true. As Christians, we are to have hope for the future. We are to be optimistic and not pessimistic. The joy of the Lord is our strength. We know that our Lord and our God can make a way out of no way. But here is Thomas. Jesus has been embarrassed, killed and buried by the non-believers in the government. The people who had once praised Christ were the same ones who cried out, crucify him. You want to talk about a bad day? After three years of ministry effort, climbing, this effort moving forward exponentially in popularity and power, Thomas had no expectation that this was going to end. And Thomas, along with the other disciples, did not want to listen to Jesus when he told them that it was going to end. When Jesus told them the whole truth, that the cross was coming, that message went in one ear and out the other. That teaching went over their heads. Likewise, when scripture tells us that all who live a godly life will suffer persecution, that the world who hated Christ will also hate his most devoted disciples and followers, and many of us like Thomas and some of the other disciples. Yes, there were two other disciples on the road to Emmaus. They were flat out walking away from the place of blessing, from the place that Jesus had told them to wait and have patience. Jesus had to have a special talk with those two disciples to get them back on track, to get them back in the faith. Because like Thomas, they were also doubting, having second thoughts. And the key is, brothers and sisters, the thing that I want us to focus on and examine today is the results of our expectations and feelings. And the problem occurs when our expectations and our feelings are not met and satisfied. What are we going to do? How are we going to act when we expect certain things to happen and they do not happen? How are we going to respond when we have been trusting in God, when we are not asking for a miracle, 
We are looking for reasonable, something reasonable, a reasonable outcome. Our prayer, our supplication to our God and to our Lord. We are not asking for too much. We are not asking for a miracle. Is it wrong for us to have an expectation of hope and positivity? That good things will come our way on account of us being Christian? Should not this happen in our lives? Should we not have these expectations for and from our God and our Lord? But what happens when our reasonable expectations are not fulfilled? When our feelings are hurt? When things didn't go our way? When things don't turn out how we expect? Is it now time to doubt? Is it now time to lose hope? Is it now time to walk away? This is what some of the other disciples and Thomas did. They began to doubt. They began to walk away. They began to lose hope. When they saw their Lord and their master so spitefully mistreated by the Romans. When they saw their Lord and their master killed and buried. Now Christ had told them what would happen and scripture records the prophecy. But for some reason or another, Thomas and many of the other disciples had missed that part of the scripture and teaching. They happened to not be paying full attention when Christ told them about the cross. They happened to miss when Jesus told them that a storm was coming. Life was going to just be good as far as they expected. They never considered that a storm was coming into their lives. In the parable of the wise and foolish builders in Matthew chapter 7, Jesus tells us all that a storm will come into both builders' lives and situations. Both the wise and foolish will experience storms in their lives. Oftentimes we will miss these important parts of scripture. We may be too preoccupied with looking for the blessings and the good things that the Lord has done for us now and into the future. We learn that God is for us. And if God be for us, who can be against us? We learn these things, but we often, some of us, never seem to think about how God is for us when the storms come into our lives, when all chaos breaks forth in our lives. We don't seem to remember how God is for us when everything around us is falling apart. And how is God for us? How was God for Thomas? When he had left his job, his home, his career, he had left everything to follow Christ. Jesus' embarrassment on the cross, if it is perceived that way, was just as much as Thomas's failure and embarrassment for his decision to leave all and follow Christ. Was Thomas's thinking on these things the source of his doubt? The reality check of Christ's death on the cross, his misunderstanding on how this fit into God's plan for victory and success for men and women. Was this the source of his doubt and faithlessness? Now let's look at how far Thomas had fallen away from the right path. In verse 24, it says, now Thomas, also known as Didymus, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. Now this message that Thomas received was not just from anybody. It was from his brothers and sisters in Christ, the same brothers, disciples, who had walked and talked and lived with him and Christ for over three years.
Now Thomas had eventually acquiesced and made the decision to be with his brothers that next week. But let us look at what he asked for proof. He now wanted to put his fingers into the nail prints and his hand into the side of Jesus Christ. He was now looking for physical proof. This is the same type of questions and proof that a non-believer asks for. Someone who is considering or someone who first comes to Christ and asks for some physical proof, evidence. I want to feel it. If I don't feel it and verify it with my own hands, then I'm not going to be a believer. I'm not going to believe based on you guys' word. After all that time and all that teaching, Thomas had fallen into a position of almost utter non-belief. Was it his unfulfilled expectations? Was it that his feelings were hurt? That he was in an emotional state, distraught because his master and teacher had been killed? That this storm had come into the ministry of Jesus Christ? This ministry effort of Christ was being buffeted by a most grievous and terrible storm? That the whole world of the disciples and Thomas was falling apart? Were these things unfulfilled expectations in the storms of life? Were these things going to be enough to change Thomas from faith to doubt? To retract all the progress that he had been making in the gospel of Jesus Christ? Would these be the things to cause Thomas to stumble? To stumble right out of life and into death? to cast his faith aside for doubt? And brothers and sisters, we need to begin to look at these things. We need to start looking at the situations that are presented to us in Scripture where men and women have cast their faith aside for doubt and fear. They have put their faith down and picked up fear and doubt. Can any storm or external situation that may come into our lives change the fact that God is for us? That Christ died on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins? That we have an inheritance and eternal life in Christ? But I think it is many, or maybe some, Christian brothers and sisters who let external situations unfulfilled expectations or even erroneous expectations hurt feelings unrestrained emotions they let these things shadow and cover their faith and when their faith is covered in shadow their life begins to be run and operated on doubt fear and deception Because without faith in God, we cannot have the truth. These two things are synonymous, the truth and faith in God. God is the truth. But Thomas was in a state on the precipice of being lost, of moving further and further away from God and into a place of deception and destruction all on account of his doubt, his faithlessness. But brothers and sisters, while we see a mistake here and the missteps that Thomas and many of the other disciples made in being inattentive to the teachings of Jesus Christ, by not adequately absorbing and understanding Christ's teachings on the cross, that this storm was soon to be coming into their lives. And scripture warns us also that there will be persecutions, tribulations, troubles that come into the life of every Christian. Brothers and sisters, this is the path that we are on as Christians. We will have to go through the valley of the shadow of death, 
but we must never forget that God is with us, Emmanuel. And while this episode brought to us in scripture on Thomas, doubt and his faithlessness, while this is a warning, it also presents to us an opportunity, an insight into growing and getting better and stronger in our faith. This example of Thomas's doubt, and even in the Old Testament, Elijah's running and hiding into a cave. These men of God have given us an example of who we are as human beings, men and women, we are subject to react to external situations. We are going to be subject to react to our feelings and our emotions on a particular issue, person or external situation. In Genesis 4, Cain decided within himself to bring an offering unto the Lord. But when his offering was rejected, while his brother's offering was accepted, Cain became angry and depressed about that situation, about his offering being rejected, and his embarrassment because his brother's offering was accepted. Cain reacted to his expectation not being fulfilled as he saw fit. Things did not go his way. But what could go his way, what was in his power, through a mind and heart full of anger and depression was the destruction of his brother. That will make me feel better. I feel hurt because I was embarrassed by being rejected. Well, now I will hurt those who hurt me out of anger. I will get back at those who hurt my emotions and feelings. I know what God said. If I do right, I will be accepted, but I am angry right now. I'm emotional. I will act out of my emotions, not out of reason or, or faith in God. And there was an emotional component to Thomas's decision, his doubt, his separating himself from his brothers and sisters in Christ. Elijah's running and hiding because Jezebel had put out a threatening message and hit out on him. He had the expectations that after the smackdown on Mark Carmel, that all people would believe, especially King Ahab and Jezebel, his wife. He didn't expect for that woman to turn around and make such a threat. As men and women with human reasonings, we often think along logical lines. We often think that other men and women can see the light as we see it. We often think that men and women will come to repentance as we came to repentance. We tend to think that people can see the error of their ways. That the troubles in their lives, the hindrances are a direct result of their being apart from God. And as Christians, when we get attacked for simply trying to help someone else to give them a message that will save their soul, that makes us perplexed that people would love to sin rather than do what is right. But these situations, these conundrums, these seemingly inconsistencies, these irrational decisions and results that as Christians we are confronted with, the storms of life, they should serve only to improve and deepen our faith in God. You see, brothers and sisters, while Thomas's situation as recorded in scriptures is an example, a warning, it is also a point at which we must move to the next level in our faith. These situations that occurred in Thomas's life and similar situations, external events, personal troubles and storms that we will experience in our life. It is a point or points where we must move to the next level of faith. 
These situations are given to us and presented to us in scriptures so that we will be able to deepen our faith. The foundation of our salvation, the roots of our faith can go deeper into our lives and into our hearts and make us a more stable man or woman, follower of Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we are to build our lives on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. We are to have a solid foundation in faith where we cannot be moved. If nothing is going to separate God from us, then we have to be growing and moving to the position where nothing is going to separate us from God. Thomas had walked with Christ and experienced Christ for over three years. He had seen miracles. He had performed miraculous events. He had been given the power to heal the sick and cast out demons and preach the word. Surely he should have been able to hold on to Christ during this storm, during the days when Christ had been crucified, died and buried. Likewise, brothers and sisters, the role and path that we take in Jesus Christ, a path of faith, from a certain perspective, it will not get easier. The transformation from death to life in Christ and from foolishness to faith and righteousness, this transformation, this path has challenges, but these challenges serve a twofold purpose. We have an enemy that will always attempt to stall our progress in Christ. But we also have the opportunity to grow and improve in our faith and knowledge of God. The storms, trials, temptations show us who we are and who God is in our lives. In the faith that we have in the beginning of our journey in Christ is the same faith that we need and hopefully will continue to have when our journey is complete. And it will be by faith that we walk into the victory that we have in Jesus Christ. And I pray that we are able to hear this word of the Lord. May this word of the Lord come into us and change our hearts and minds according to the will of God. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.